Hi everyone, and welcome to the 10th week of Introduction to Causal Inference. This week we'll be covering causal discovery from observational data. A natural question is, what do I mean by causal discovery? And to motivate that, consider what we've been doing throughout this course. We've been doing causal inference, inferring causal effects, given some causal assumptions, basically where we assume that we have the causal graph. But what if we don't have the causal graph? That's what causal discovery is here for. So with causal discovery, our goal is to start from just data and then learn the causal graph from that data. Then if we wanted to infer causal effects from there, we can just apply stuff that we've learned earlier in the course. And I've used the word identification throughout the course. Now we're going to have a new sort of definition for identification. We're going to have structure identification, which we'll be talking about in this lecture. So whenever I say identify in this lecture, it's about if we can identify the causal graph. Identification of structure rather than of causal estimates. Here's the outline of this lecture. There's two main categories of methods that we'll see a bit of. The first is independence-based causal discovery in that we try to discover conditional independencies in the data and then use those to infer the causal graph. And then the second one is semi-parametric causal discovery. There we make some parametric assumptions about the functional form of how the data was generated and then leverage those assumptions to do causal discovery. As you know, we always have a big focus on assumptions in this course. So with that, let's get right into the assumptions for independence-based causal discovery. The new assumption that we need to make for independence-based causal discovery is what's known as the faithfulness assumption. So recall the Markov assumption from week three of the course when we were introducing graphs. This assumption says that if X and Y are deseparated in the graph by some conditioning set Z, then that implies that X and Y are conditionally independent in distribution, where they're conditioning on some conditioning set Z. So this Markov assumption tells us how to go from the causal graph on the left-hand side of this implication to some statement about the distribution of the data on the right-hand side of this implication. But to do causal discovery, we really want to be able to go the other direction. We want to be able to start with data and then infer the causal graph from there. So we need an assumption that has an implication in the other direction. And this is the faithfulness assumption. It's just the converse of the Markov assumption. So using faithfulness, we can search for conditional independencies in the data. So in this data distribution P. And then once we find those, then that will tell us something about the graphical structure. It will tell us what's deseparated from what. So we haven't had to make the faithfulness assumption at all throughout this course until now. And that's good because the faithfulness assumption is a bit less attractive than the Markov assumption because it's easy to think of counterexamples to the faithfulness assumption. So here's one example for a violation of faithfulness. We'll just copy and paste the assumption here. And the common example of violation of faithfulness is to have a graph where, let's focus on A and D here, we have a graph where the association flowing from A to D is canceled out along these two different paths. So the idea here is that the blue path cancels the red path in terms of the association flowing along them. These paths are like opposites in a sense, and their associations cancel so that we get that A is independent of D in the distribution, even though A and D aren't deseparated in this graph. Okay, so if faithfulness were true, we would have that A and D are independent, which then implies that A and D are deseparated. That's what we would have if faithfulness were true, if it weren't violated. But in this example, it is violated. To make this a bit more concrete, I'm going to add some coefficients to these paths here. And what 
these mean is in a linear example, it corresponds to these structural equations. I haven't added any noise terms to these structural equations, but you could do the same thing with noise terms. It would just uh, be a bit less minimal of an example. Okay, so this edge from A to B corresponds to this structural equation with alpha here. From A to C is this structural equation with gamma. And then the D structural equation corresponds to these two edges coming into D with beta and delta. Then if we plug in for B and C in the structural equation for D, if we plug in their corresponding structural equations, then we get this for D in terms of A. This captures the association flowing from A to D. It's alpha times beta plus gamma times delta. And so the concrete version of the path canceling that we were graphically depicting with that blue and red arcs is if alpha times beta equals the negative of gamma times delta. So if this is the case, then this factor in front of A is equal to zero, meaning that the association that's flowing from A to D is zero. So that's an example of a violation of faithfulness, and we're assuming that we don't have these kinds of violations when we're assuming the faithfulness assumption. And then the other two assumptions are much more familiar. The first one, causal sufficiency, is just a way of saying that there's no unobserved confounders of any of the variables in the graph. And the second one, acyclicity, is just what we've been doing throughout this course. The graphs are acyclic. So listing all the assumptions together, we have the Markov assumption still, the faithfulness assumption, causal sufficiency, and acyclicity. That brings us to the end of the assumptions section and to our first question, which is, why is the Markov assumption plus causal sufficiency and acyclicity not enough for learning causal graphs from data? In this next section, we'll introduce the very important concept of Markov equivalence and give the main theorem around independence-based causal discovery and what it has to do with Markov equivalence. So here we have a chain graph going to the right, a chain graph going to the left, and a fork graph. Recall that we first saw these structures back in week three, and we saw what conditional independence assumption these graphs imply, given the Markov assumption. That's that x1 is independent of x3 conditional on x2. In all three of these different graphs, this is the case. And minimality also told us that x1 is dependent on x2 and x2 is dependent on x3. Here, faithfulness will be guaranteeing that x1 is dependent on x3. Minimality didn't quite guarantee this because there can be some intransitive cases. But the main thing you can focus on here is just the what the Markov assumption tells us. The thing I want to emphasize here with the fact that I put these three graphs on the same slide and say they all imply the same conditional independence, given the Markov assumption, is that these three graphs are Markov equivalent. That's just what we mean by they imply the same conditional independence assumption. And some other terminology that we'll be using is that they're all in the same Markov equivalence class. That's a class of graphs that all imply the same conditional independencies. So that's chains and forks, but immoralities are a bit special, if you remember from back in week three. Here I've just copy and pasted the chains and forks Markov equivalence class on the right here, where I have this blue circle around it to indicate that this is a class of graphs, a set of graphs. Unlike chains and forks, immoralities have this interesting property where x1 is independent of x3 conditional on nothing, right? So this property does not match the chains and forks one, where we have to condition on x2 to get independence. Otherwise, they're dependent. And with immoralities, x1 and x3 are dependent if we do condition on x2, right? So it's kind of like the reverse of what's going on here in the chains and forks. So this means that immoralities are outside of the Markov equivalence class for chains and forks. 
and they're in their own Markov equivalence class. So unlike chains and forks, if you're in immorality, then you're single in your Markov equivalence class. So if we can somehow figure out the Markov equivalence class when the true graph is the basic immorality here, then we can actually identify the full graph. So once we know this blue circle, and because there's only one graph in there, we've identified the causal graph as the basic immorality. Whereas if we just figure out the Markov equivalence class for when the true graph is a chain or a fork, then all we know is that it's one of these three graphs. We don't know which one it is. Okay, so that's the sort of special information that immoralities tell us, but chains and forks must also tell us some useful information that we can leverage in causal discovery. And that has to do with skeletons. So the skeleton of these three graphs here, the two chains and the fork, is this graph, where the way we get a skeleton is just by turning directed edges into undirected edges. So you can check that for these three graphs, if we turn the directed edges into undirected edges, they all give this same skeleton. And the information that this skeleton tells us is that x1 is independent of x3, conditional on x2. That's in contrast to a graph like this one, which is the chain where we've added an edge from x1 to x3. In this graph, x1 is still dependent on x3, even after we condition on x2, because there's, there's this direct edge from x1 to x3. Okay, so this graph here is outside this Markov equivalence class, and we can tell that based on the fact that it has a different skeleton than the chains and fork have. So the skeleton of a graph tells us some useful information about the Markov equivalence class as well. So there are two important qualities of graphs that we can use to distinguish graphs from each other based on the conditional independencies that they encode. And that's immoralities, which we saw a couple slides ago, how those are special, and the skeleton of a graph, which we saw on just the last slide. So we've built up intuition for these two things on the previous two slides, and that leads us to this very important theorem, which is that two graphs are Markov equivalent if and only if they have the same skeleton and the same immoralities. If you think about this a bit and realize you have no intuition for this, then I recommend going back to slides and rewatching that bit on why immoralities are special and then on skeletons. And then why do we care about this theorem? Like what, what does it do for us? Well, it tells us that if we're trying to infer the graph from just conditional independencies that we find in the data, then the best we can do is discover what's called the essential graph, which is just the skeleton of the true graph plus the immorality. So take the skeleton of the real graph and then orient the edges of the immoralities. This sort of partially directed graph is what we can expect to discover from independence-based causal discovery. Another word for this is CPDAG, where CPDAG stands for completed, partially directed, a cyclic graph. Not all of the edges will be directed. And this essential graph, or CPDAG, you can think of as a sort of graphical representation of the Markov equivalence class. We'll see an algorithm for discovering this essential graph, or this Markov equivalence class that we can actually infer from data based on conditional independencies in the data. But before we do that, let's make sure that this Markov equivalence stuff is clear and go through a few questions and examples on it. The first question is, what graphs are Markov equivalent to the basic fork graph? The second question is, what graphs are Markov equivalent to the basic immorality? The answers to both of these two questions are 
in a few slides ago, so go ahead and check those out if you can't quite recall the answers. Then the next question is, what graphs is the following graph Markov equivalent to? So basically the way we'll do this is just try to flip edges and see if we get graphs that still have the same skeleton and immoralities. We're going to ensure that we have the same skeleton by just flipping the edges and then we'll make sure we don't introduce any new immoralities or get rid of any. This graph doesn't have any immoralities, so we just need to not introduce new immoralities. So the first graph this is, this is Markov equivalent to is if we flip the A to B edge. Note that if we had flipped the C to B edge, then we would introduce an immorality. C to B and then A to B would be an immorality. So that's a graph that this graph is not Markov equivalent to. Okay, so here's one that we saw it's Markov equivalent to, and then there are two more. Another is if we take this graph and then we flip the C to B edge. And then finally, there's this graph where the D to B edge is pointing to B, and then the other two edges are pointing outward. So again, for example, if we were to take this graph on the right here and then flip the AB edge so that we have it pointing from A to B, then we'd be introducing a new immorality. So that graph would not be Markov equivalent to these four graphs. It would be in a different Markov equivalence class. The next question is, what graphs is the following graph Markov equivalent to? This is a bit of a trick question in that this graph is alone in its own Markov equivalence class. So that's because it's engaged in an immorality. This A to C and then B to C is an immorality, which means that this graph will be alone in its Markov equivalence class. So to see that, let's consider what would happen if we flipped edges. If we flipped this AC edge so that we had an edge from C to A, then we would get rid of this immorality. And so then it would be a different, uh, it would imply different conditional independencies based on that theorem. Remember, we have to keep the skeleton and the same immoralities. Same if we were to flip this CB edge. And then finally, if we flipped this DC edge so that we it went from D to C, then we would have new immoralities. Right, then we'd have this immorality, D and B would have a, this child together without being uh, connected. And then also A and D would have C as a child together without being connected. Right, so there'd just be immoralities all over the place. But importantly, we needed to have only this immorality, the A and B as a immoral parents of C. We can't have D jumping in there making things uh, more immoral. As according to the theorem, that would give us a graph that is not Markov equivalent to this one. And then the final question is this one, where I, I'm just asking you to give a few graphs that the following graph is Markov equivalent to. I won't actually give you the answer for this one, so go ahead and pause and take a think here. Next up, we'll cover the PC algorithm, which is an algorithm for learning the essential graph, this graphical representation of the Markov equivalence class that we can discover using independence-based causal discovery. This is one popular algorithm for independence-based causal discovery, but there are others. We'll give a quick overview of the PC algorithm before we cover each of its steps. So there's three steps. And in this overview, we'll have a sort of true graph in mind. We're going to try to learn the essential graph of this true graph using these three steps of the PC algorithm. So the first thing, or so step zero in the PC algorithm is to start with a complete undirected graph. So a complete graph is one in which there is an edge between every pair of variables. A complete graph essentially encodes that we're not assuming any conditional independencies about the distribution. So we're allowing distributions to be any distribution. 
then the PC algorithm is three steps. The first step is to identify the skeleton. This is us making use of the information about the skeleton that we can in actually get from the data, assuming we have enough data to do these conditional independence tests. Then the second step is to identify the immoralities and orient them. So we can identify this A to C, B to C immorality. And then in the third step, we can orient more edges using the fact that we would have discovered any immoralities that existed in phase two. So edges that are incident on colliders in an immorality can sometimes be oriented away from the collider. So in steps two and three here, we're using the information in the data that tells us about immoralities in the graph. So remember, there's two kind of key structures we emphasize. There's the skeleton, and then there's immoralities. And the skeleton is step one. Immoralities are steps two and three. Okay, so that's just kind of an overview of the PC algorithm, but now we'll go into each of these steps in more detail. In step one for identifying the skeleton, what we do is we start with the complete undirected graph, and then we remove edges x, y, where x and y are independent condition on some conditioning set z, where that conditioning set could be empty, could be of size one, of two, whatever conditioning set you want, except for including x and y, can include x and y. And we start with conditioning sets of smaller size and then increase the size of the conditioning set. So first start with the empty set, conditioning set of size zero, then go to conditioning sets of size one, do that for all possible variables we can condition on, then conditioning sets of size two. So that's the number of nodes choose two, then of size three, that's number of nodes choose three, and so on. Okay, so let's see what this looks like in our example where this is the true graph. We start with this complete graph, and then the first thing we do is, in the data, detect that A is independent of B. We find that when we are running the independence test for the empty set as the conditioning set, and we have this independence because we try to look for any path from A to B, and the only one is blocked by this collider C. So that means that all paths from A to B are blocked, so there's no association flowing between A and B. A and B are independent. This means we can remove this edge between A and B in our graph that started off as a complete graph. Then we move to conditioning sets of size one. And so what we do is for all other pairs of variables, other than C here, so C is gonna be the main use variable that's useful to condition on. So for all other pairs, X and Y, so that's like A and D is one pair, A and E is another pair, B and D, B and E, and even A and B. For all other pairs, we detect the ones that are independent, so that's everything, and then we remove all those edges. Okay, so what's going on there? Let's start with A and D. There's this path, there's only one path from A to D, which is through C. It's this chain, and that path is blocked by conditioning on C. So A is independent of D, conditional on C. That's why we removed this edge that was here. Same thing from A to E. That's another chain, and that's why we removed this edge from A to E. Then the same thing for B to D and B to E. And I mentioned that we'll also do the test for A and B, but we find that A and B are not independent, conditional on C, because this is a collider. And we're just gonna store that information for later, say. That might be useful information for detecting colliders, for example. But so, We've gotten up to conditioning sets of size one, and we've already identified the skeleton. So we've completed step one, essentially. And you can keep going up in higher and higher conditioning sets, but we don't need to do that for now because we have the skeleton. Though you might not know that you have the skeleton if you're doing this in practice. 
Okay, so we have the skeleton from step one, and now in step two, we want to identify the immoralities. So in this step, what we do is for any paths, x, z, y in our working graph that's at the bottom right here, where the following two conditions are true. One, we discover that there is no edge between x and y in our previous step. So we've removed the direct edge between x and y in step one. Graphically, that means that in this structure, x, z, y, there's no arc here connecting x and y. And then two, z was not in the conditioning set that makes x and y conditionally independent. Another way you could think of this is that when you condition on z, x and y are dependent. But just because the algorithm will work by testing for conditional independence, uh, that's why it's phrased this way in condition two. So if we have these two conditions satisfied, then we know that x, z, y forms an immorality where x and y are pointing into z. Okay, so in our example on the bottom right here, let's look at condition one. There's no edge between x and y in a previous step. So that's a and b. There's no edge connecting them. We removed that edge on the previous step. And then condition two is that z was not in the conditioning set that makes x and y conditionally independent. So z here is c, and c was not in the conditioning set that makes a and b independent, right? So that conditioning set was empty. So that condition two is satisfied. So then we know that x, z, y structure, which the a, c, b here, forms an immorality. So in step two here, we have identified all the immoralities in this graph with just one immorality. So this allows us to orient some of these edges. And finally, in step three, we're going to try to orient some other edges. The main idea here is that in the last step, we would discover all the immoralities. And we can use that fact that we should have discovered all the immoralities to orient even more edges that are not part of immoralities. So for example, this CD edge here, if D were pointing to C, that would form another immorality with A and with B as well. So because we didn't detect that immorality back in step two where we detect immoralities, that means that the edge actually has to be pointing from C to D. So the way that we do this more formally is that any edge Z, Y, part of a partially directed path of the form X points to Z and then undirected edge to Y, where there is no edge connecting X and Y, so no like arc like that. Any structure like this, the edge that's undirected here can be oriented so that it's directed from Z to Y. Right, so in that example that we just discussed with D, let's just consider this path A to C to D. That matches this X to Z, then undirected to Y. And there's no edge connecting X and Y. There's no edge connecting X, A, and D here. So that means that this edge, Z to Y, right in this structure here, which is C and D here, this edge can be oriented like that. And then the edge CE can be oriented for the same reasons. So that's step three. Step three here for this specific example allowed us to actually completely identify the causal graph, right? So by that, I mean that we oriented all of the edges. We didn't leave any edges undirected, which means we discovered the Markov equivalence class of this graph which happens to be a singleton graph. So cool. In this example, we have identified the graph. That won't be the case in general. We won't always be able to identify the exact graph from conditional independencies in the data. Rather, we, as we say, we'll be able to identify the Markov equivalence class. And that Markov equivalence class will often have several graphs in it, represented by some of the edges being undirected in the essential graph. So that's the PC algorithm. And what if we don't like some of the assumptions that we had to make for this algorithm? So for example, say we don't want to assume causal sufficiency. We want to allow for unobserved confounders. Well, there's algorithms that 
try to drop that assumption. So for example, there's the fast causal inference, FCI algorithm. Or if you don't like acyclicity, there's this CCD algorithm as an example. And if you want to drop both of those assumptions, there's this satisfiability-based causal discovery. So for example, you can check out these two papers where SAT or satisfiability, um, if you're familiar with it, what they do is they reduce causal discovery to a satisfiability problem. And then they just give those constraints to a SAT solver. I won't really get into that here, but basically you're able to drop the causal sufficiency and acyclicity assumptions when you're using those methods. And then one final thing that we'll discuss before we complete this section is that conditional independence testing is hard. So these causal discovery algorithms that are independence-based, where we're taking data and then trying to discover conditional independencies in the data to identify the graphs, to discover graphs, these algorithms rely on having accurate conditional independence tests. And they can definitely have that if we have infinite data, for example, then conditional independence testing is relatively easy. However, in general, we don't have infinite data, and it can be quite a hard problem when we have finite data, as conditional independence tests can sometimes require a lot of data to get accurate test results. You can check out this paper if you want to learn more about that. That concludes the section on the PC algorithm and brings us to this question, which is, what are the essential graphs of the following graphs? on these four graphs here. So the first one on the left here, its essential graph is when we just undirect all of the edges. Then the next one, this basic morality, as we discussed, it is its own essential graph. It's the only graph in its Markov equivalence class. Then the essential graph for this next graph is where all of the edges are undirected. And finally, the essential graph for this last one is itself. All right, we can't change the orientation of any of these edges without changing the immoralities. And then the second question, which I won't give an answer to, is just walk through the steps of PC to get these graphs. Then the next question is, what is the essential graph for this graph? You don't have to walk through the steps of PC here, but go ahead and try to figure out what the essential graph is for this one. Then a natural question is, can we do better than identifying just the Markov equivalent class? So we saw that with the faithfulness assumption, we can identify the essential graph we can identify the Markov equivalence class of the true graph. But say there's multiple graphs in that Markov equivalence class, can we narrow the class down more? So ideally, we would get to just a single graph. Can we do that? For example, if we make more assumptions? Well, in the setting where we have multinomial distributions, or we have linear Gaussian structural equations, this is the best we can do. We can only identify a graph up to its Markov equivalence class. We can't get anything smaller than that. Okay, but this seems a bit specific. Like, why are we talking about linear Gaussian structural equations? What if we care about non-Gaussian structural equations, where the, the noise is non-Gaussian? Or non-linear structural equations? And the spoiler is that we can get identifiability of the exact graph in those cases. So that's what we'll see in this semi-parametric causal discovery section. It's semi-parametric in the sense that we'll be making assumptions about the parametric form of these structural equations, right? So the sort of functional form of how the data was generated. We saw some examples of parametric assumptions for identifiability of causal estimates, not of graph structures, but of causal estimates, in the week on instrument of variables, for example. So to motivate this section, let's quickly discuss some issues with independence-based causal discovery that we don't that we won't have in semi-parametric causal discovery. The first is that 
Independence-based causal discovery requires the faithfulness assumption, which we saw is maybe sometimes not that attractive of an assumption. It's kind of easy to think up counterexamples to it. Then the next big issue, which we already touched, is that it can require large samples for accurate conditional independence tests. And finally, with independence-based causal discovery, we can only identify up to the Markov equivalence class of the true graph. Whereas with semi-parametric causal discovery, we'll often be able to pick out the exact graph that is the true causal graph, assuming that our semi-parametric assumptions are correct. In the first part of this section on semi-parametric causal discovery, we're going to point out that you can't identify the true causal graph without making any parametric assumptions. So by identifiability here, in this whole lecture, we're referring to identifying the graph, not some causal estimate. And if we want to identify that graph, not just the Markov equivalence class of that graph, if we want to identify the specific graph, we have to make parametric assumptions. So we'll see why that's the case now. First, we'll look at this through the perspective of Markov equivalence. So if we have infinite data, we have access to P of X comma Y. Here we have two variables, X and Y. And say we want to distinguish just these two graphs. Is our data generated by a graph where Y is generated as a function of X? Or is our data generated by data where X is generated as a function of Y, right? Which causal graph is it? Can we infer that from this infinite data that we have? Well, if we're looking at conditional independencies in the data, no, right? The essential graph, which depicts the Markov equivalence class here, doesn't have the direction of the edge in it, right? Both of these graphs here, both of these graphs correspond to where we're not making any conditional independence assumptions. So they could correspond to any distribution. And here's the Markov equivalence class for that. That's the perspective on if we can identify which of these two graphs generated this data with two variables from Markov equivalence. But maybe if we look at it from a different perspective, from SCMs, structural causal models, and their structural equations, then maybe we can identify which of those two causal graphs generated our data? Well, unfortunately, it turns out that's not the case. So there's this proposition that for every joint distribution, p of x comma y, on two real-valued random variables, there is an SCM in either direction that generates data consistent with that distribution. In other words, an SCM where x is generated from y could have generated the data, or an SCM where Y is generated from X could have generated the data. So we don't know which variable was generated from which. We, we can't distinguish between those two causal graphs. Mathematically, this is written as follows. So there exists a function F sub Y such that Y equals F sub Y where you feed X and some noise variable U sub Y and where x and u sub y are independent. So there exists a function in that direction, mapping x to y, and similarly there exists a function going the other direction, f of x, and similarly we have independence here. So there exists these functions that are consistent with the data distribution. We can generate data that is consistent with p of x comma y using either this SCM or this SCM in the opposite direction. So that first one corresponds to this causal graph, x to y, and then the second one corresponds to this causal graph where there's an arrow from y to x. Either causal graph could explain our data. So here, we haven't made any restrictions on our SCMs. The SCMs can be whatever. And when that's the case, we are not able to identify the true causal graph. We can't distinguish between these two causal graphs to know which one is the true one. And in order to do that, we're going to need to make some assumptions about the parametric form. 
the first class of assumptions we'll make is that our structural equations are linear with non-Gaussian noise. So recall that we cannot hope to identify the graph more precisely than its Markov equivalent class in the linear Gaussian noise setting. But that setting seemed oddly specific. What if the noise is non-Gaussian, for example? So by the linear non-Gaussian noise assumption, I mean that all structural equations, causal mechanisms that generate the data, are of the following form, where y is generated as a linear function of x, so a linear function, plus some noise term u, where x and u are independent, and importantly, u is distributed as some non-Gaussian. So if u were Gaussian here, we have this impossibility result that we can only do as well as the Markov equivalence class. But if u is non-Gaussian, we're going to be able to exactly identify the graph. That's what this theorem from Shimizu et al. 2016 states. So it's saying that in the linear non-Gaussian setting, if the true SCM is this one where y is generated from x, then there does not exist an SCM in the reverse direction, where x is generated from y, where y and this u tilde are independent. So there doesn't exist such an SCM in the reverse direction that can generate the data consistent with the observational distribution. Of course, there exists an SCM in the true direction that can generate data consistent with the observational distribution, but in the linear non-Gaussian setting, there doesn't exist an SCM in the reverse direction for generating that observational distribution. Because there doesn't exist an SCM in the reverse direction, we are able to identify the direction of this edge. We won't cover the proof in this lecture, but you can see the proof in the course book. Okay, so that's the result, but what's something that you can use to help remember this, uh, so give you some intuition for why we have this result? Turns out it's going to be having a lot to do with these independencies here, so the input variable being independent from the noise, and then here we're going to have that the input variable is not going to be independent from the noise in the reverse direction. Okay, so that's what we'll see here. So say that we have some data and we're going to regress y on x. So we're going to fit a linear regression to these data points and get this line. And we'll say that this is the correct causal direction. In other words, y is generated from x. When we do the linear regression in this causal direction, we get this nice line that seems to fit the data pretty well. But when you do the regression in the anti-causal direction, when the noise term is non-Gaussian, you don't get such a nice line. You actually get something that looks like this. Okay, so this line doesn't quite look right. It doesn't look like this line where we do the regression in the causal direction, but in the anti-causal direction, we get this line, and this happens only because the noise term is non-Gaussian. If the noise term were Gaussian, we wouldn't have this. Okay, so something seems off here, but to get a bit more clarity on this, we have to look at the residuals. So by looking at the residuals, that's where we subtract our prediction here. So this is our prediction if we were to fit this function using linear regression. If we're to subtract our prediction from the true value, right, so it's just like moving this to the other side, then we isolate the residual. Same thing in the causal direction. We would be fitting this function, and so subtract that to the other side, we'd be trying to estimate this residual. So we're gonna look at the residual plots to kind of get plots of this u and this tilde u here. So this is what our residual plot looks like when we do the linear regression in the causal direction, regressing y on x, in this plot we have the residuals on the y-axis, which is like an estimate of u, and we have x on the x-axis. So we're kind of trying to see if x is independent of u, and it looks pretty independent of u here. 
But then when we look at the regression in the anti-causal direction, now here we're regressing x on y, and now on the y-axis we have this u tilde. And on the x-axis we have y now, because we want to be matching this sort of input variable. Now we see that y is dependent on u tilde. Okay, so this looks pretty independent, right? So the distribution of the residual u here doesn't seem to be changing as we condition on different values of x. So they're independent. But then here, this distribution of u, so it's pretty thin here when we condition on values of y over here, gets a bit wider as we condition on values of y over here, the distribution is getting wider, okay, and then it thins out again. So clearly the support is changing as we change y. So u tilde absolutely depends on y. And this is the anti-causal SCM, right? We are trying to fit an SCM in the anti-causal direction, but we didn't get one, right? Because we needed y to be independent of the noise term in the anti-causal direction, but it's clearly not. You can check out the proof in the book if you want to see kind of the technical stuff going on for how to prove this, but hopefully this gives you some good intuition and helps you remember this. There are several extensions to this linear non-Gaussian identifiability result and method. So what we were looking at was just for two variables, x and y, but you can extend it to multiple variables, so this multivariate setting. And if you want to drop some assumptions, you can drop the causal sufficiency assumption. That's what they work on in this paper. Or drop the acyclicity assumption. That's what they work on in this paper. In the final section, we'll look at a nonlinear semi-parametric assumption where we are assuming additive noise. So let's see what that is. Again, recall that we cannot hope to identify the graph more precisely than the Markov equivalence class in the linear Gaussian noise setting. But what if the structural equations are nonlinear? So here is this nonlinear additive noise assumption. For all variables, for all i, the structural equation that generates x sub i is a nonlinear function f sub i, so f sub i is nonlinear function of the parents of the ith variable, plus some noise term here. Okay, so that's the nonlinear additive noise assumption. So importantly, this is additive. Under this assumption, and under the Markov assumption, the causal sufficiency assumption, acyclicity, and then this, this nonlinear additive noise assumption, as Moy just mentioned, and then a technical condition from the paper where this comes from, which we won't get into, under these assumptions, we can identify the causal graph, right? So we don't just get the Markov equivalence class, we get the precise graph, a single graph. But it's only the correct graph under this nonlinear additive noise assumption and the technical condition from their paper. Cool, so this seems a bit more flexible in the sense that we don't have to assume that the functional form is linear, it can be nonlinear now. But say you don't like that we're assuming this additive noise. Well, we can get that to be a bit more general. So you don't like additive noise. Then just kind of chuck in another function on the outside there. right? So it's post nonlinear in the sense that it's this g comes after we've added, we've added u here. But it's not quite additive noise in the sense that we also have this function of both of these after we've added it. Okay, so in this post nonlinear setting where you just have this function g, this function f, then you can get an identifiability result there as well. If you want to learn even more about causal discovery from observational data, here are three nice sources. So the first one is a review article from Frederick Eberhardt. The second one is Another review article from some pretty big authors. So all three of these guys do a lot of research on this topic. I think this guy is the P in the 
P C algorithm. I think the P comes from from this guy. So his first name starts with a P, Peter. And then this guy is the C in the PC algorithm, Clark. And then this guy just does a ton of papers on this topic. So, uh, yeah, so they all wrote a review paper together. And then the last resource on this list is a book called Elements of Causal Inference, where it's basically the only book on causal discovery from observational data. And we're lucky enough to have the first author on this book, Jonas Peters, give a guest talk in this course. So the next video that gets uploaded to the channel will be his guest talk, which will be in the full lectures playlist. If you're looking at the playlist of smaller videos, it's not in that playlist, it's in the full lectures one. If you want to get notified for that lecture or any stuff coming up in the future, any lectures, any other videos coming up in the future, then go ahead and hit the subscribe button below. And same with the bell icon next to it. You have any good jokes about immoralities, go ahead and leave those in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. Not that I can actually see you through your webcam or anything. I don't think the NSA cares enough about causal inference quite yet for that to be the case, but I don't know what time you're watching this lecture in the future.